And so I went downtown and I pulled, I pulled the mortgage on my property and I went down and I saw her and I gave it to her and I said, can you prepare a satisfaction of mortgage for this? And she was like, holy shit, you're seriously going to do this? I go, absolutely. So this is the next video. I'm going to go over, uh, I'm continuing with my story. If you haven't been watching the stories, you need to go back and start at the beginning. All right. So what I did was I figured out how to get social security to, well, I started with just random, um, social security numbers and that didn't work out. Then I figured out that I needed a social security number that had never been used. And it was hard to figure out, well, whose social security numbers are active that haven't been used. And I actually had a client that had come in. This is how I figured this out. I had a client that had come in and she had, she was making whatever. She made like $40,000 a year and I pulled her credit and her credit was perfect. But then when she came in to provide all of her W2s and pay stubs and stuff, this is, by the way, this had happened like a year or so earlier where I figured this out. She had come in and she said, she provided me with her W-2s. And her W-2s, I noticed that the social security number on her W-2s were different than what she'd given me. So we asked her to come in, and I obviously they were also different than the, um, the credit I'd pulled. So I asked her to come in, and she sat down in my office. And I was like, look, I noticed that the, the W-2 has this SOCH, but you gave me this SOCH. And that's what I pulled it under, pulled the credit under, and it's perfect credit. But your W-2 has a different SOCH. And she, I remember she got a little scared. She looked a little bit worried. And I was like, I said, listen, I promise you, I said, I'm not calling anybody. You're not in trouble. I don't care what you've done. I just want to know how it works because you have perfect credit. So, and I want to make sure, I said, but I have a feeling if I pull this social security number on your W-2, which is probably your true social security number, you'll probably have bad credit. And she looked at me and she was like, I do have bad credit. And I said, okay, so what happened? What are we doing here? I need to know before I send it to the lender to, so I can figure out if they can figure out what you've done because I can't send these W-2s. I have to change the W-2s. I have to figure out what's happening here. So she goes, okay, here's what happened. She said, I was married and I had been using my husband. My husband and I had the, you know, she was using his, his uh, surname. And she said, they got divorced. He stopped paying credit cards. Uh, they got evicted. She said, so when I got, got evicted with him, it showed up on my credit. All of my credit cards were horrible. So she had a friend that told her, why don't you use your sons or daughters? I forget which it was, but her child who was like five years old, why don't you use his social security number with your name? And she went, okay. She said, I'll, uh, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll try. So she went and applied for, for an apartment using her maiden name which she hadn't used in 10 years and her son's social security number but everything else was normal oh and the new and another address because she'd been evicted so she's staying with a friend or something so because she had used a different date of a different address a different name and a different soch even though the date of birth was the same and part of her name was the same, like her first name was still like, you know, Karen or something. It, because of that, it created a, the credit bureaus created an entirely new profile for her. It didn't attach any of those things to her old bad credit profile, but yet she could still use her driver's license because she had a driver's license in her maiden name. So she said, I pulled, she said when they pulled it, they said I had no credit. She said, so I put down like double the security deposit and I moved right into the apartment. She said, then I turned around and she said, because we had her husband or she or whoever hadn't paid their rent, their electric, their electric bill was, was bad and it was in collections. So she went to the electric company, got the electric turned on using the different SOCH. So she got everything turned on using this new SOCH and this new credit profile. She, she said, so she then went whatever like a month or so later she said she turned around and she went and she got a car loan or something or did she get no she started getting credit card offers pre uh, pre-approved credit card offers in the mail because she'd moved into a new 
apartment complex and they had and she had gone to she'd gotten electric and all these other things turned on her name so she suddenly got a few credit cards so she said i applied for the credit card she said and they gave her like a secured credit card from like it was somebody first premiere first premiere used to give you a credit card like everybody if you had no credit you just had to pay a fee so she said i got a first premiere credit card she said a couple months later i ended up getting a, a car loan using that so she said Eventually, she said, I realized that I had perfect credit under that new Soch and her, her maiden name. So I was like, okay, so I just need to change the W-2 so that underwriting doesn't notice that the W-2s and your credit are in different, are in different uh, social security numbers. And when they pull it, they should have the same, same uh, get the same thing I got. So that's what I did, and her loan closed. But, then I, but by going through that process, I realized... I can basically make synthetic people. Like I can make people that don't really exist. So what I did was I figured out, I mean, eventually I grabbed a couple of just social security numbers. Like I went, I went in the, in the um, I went in the file cabinets and just grabbed some social security numbers from, uh, uh, from like two, three, four year old kids that I knew weren't using the socials. And I started pulling credit under vi- different names, but just to see if it would work. And then eventually I was like, okay, so I, I, I figured out, guess what? If I use a fake name, fake date of birth, a real social security number, and an address, it'll create a fake profile. Of course, it has no credit. It's just a profile, but at least it exists. Then what I realized I could do was I could then get a secured credit card. So I'd put up 300 bucks and I'd go get a credit card from like Bank of America. I'd get one from whatever, First Premier Bank, from, you know, Capital One. So I'd get like three credit cards because the minimum that you had to have was three trade lines. So it's very easy to create, to get three credit cards using security. So I give them 500 bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, whatever. And I get three different credit cards. I start making the payments. And what I realized was, well, and, and then I started making the fake names. So the fake names were typically, not always, because I had a guy named Joel Cologne. I had a guy named Alan Duncan. I had a guy named, I had a bunch of different ones. But I, I ended up making a bunch using the, the names from uh, Reservoir Dogs, which was like, you know, Mr. Black, was basically like Lee Black, um, Michael White, uh, David Silver, that sort of thing. Like, like I just color-coded names, Brandon Green, James Red, and, and, and what I would do is I get the credit cards and after you, if you made the payments for like six months and you kept the balances below 30% of the available balance. So if it's a thousand dollar credit card, you don't ever go above two or $300. Then after about six months, all of these guys started getting credit scores at, at like 700 credit scores. And I had already figured out how to make like a fake ID. I figured out how to make a fake ID by taking my real ID and I just took sandpaper and I sanded off my basic information, like my name and date of birth and, and, uh, address. And then I would print the name of whatever name I wanted in reverse on a piece of really ultra thin transparency paper. I then take clear glue, a glue stick and I'd glue it over my license in reverse. So it's the name was in reverse but it was ups, upside. But it was it was uh, inverted. So when you looked at it through the plastic, it looked per. It looked normal, and it was. And you couldn't scratch it off because it was in between the filament, right? The the transparency paper and the actual plastic, and it was glued on. So then I just trim off the excess and sand it down slightly on the edges, and it was perfect. I had a perfect ID. You could see the hologram and everything. I mean, it wasn't perfect, I guess, if you really looked at it. Although I, you know, listen, I, I had cops look at it and stuff. And they were like, it looks good. I thought, you know, it was, it was okay, but everybody thought that was great. And listen, I opened dozens of banks using those, those different, those different, uh, um, IDs, driver's licenses, my picture with the name, you know, James Red on it. Um, gosh, the first time I opened, I, I remember the first time I went and opened up a bank account with that was terrifying. Like I walked in, I have to walk in. Who was it? Oh, it was Joel Cologne. I, I had to open up. I had bought a house, renovated it, and was in the name Joel Cologne and was refinancing it to pull out a bunch of money. And I had to have a bank account because I had to have reserves in the bank. This was before I was actually making bank accounts. 
or during that same period of time, or they were going to call the bank, I think. Either way, I had to, you know, plus I have to launder the money. Like these, I'm getting checks in the names of Joel Cologne or, or Lee Black, and you have to be able to deposit that. You know, you can only put so many in your, and I can only deposit so many in my bank account before it looks odd. So you start needing bank accounts in different guys' names. So I remember walking into a bank one time and giving them the ID and telling them my name was Joel Cologne. And the chick, she looked at it and she, she typed the information in and she went, huh, that's weird. And I was like, what's that? And she goes, have you ever had a bank account? And I went, no. I said, no, no, I haven't. And, you know, I'm a 32, 33 year, I'm like a 32 year old man, 30, 33 years old at this time. So I'm 33 years old, never had a bank account. I said, I told him, oh, my ex wife had one. You know, I always used hers. Uh, yeah, I haven't had one. Uh, yeah, I haven't had one in my own, my own name in like 10 years. Like, I have no idea. But I did know that they run, everybody that goes through the banks, they ran them through either check systems or AccuCheck. And so I didn't know what came up. But obviously it said I, I, there was no record of me ever having been pulled, no inquiry. So the woman gets up, takes the, the card, the ID, and goes to the manager. And she gives it to her. And she takes it, and she looks at it, and I remember she held it up to the light and twisted it back and forth, like, and looked at each other, and then they looked over at me, and then she did it again, and she handed her the license, and walked back over, sat down, and started typing. And I go, everything okay? And I said, everything okay? And she was like, uh, she goes, yeah, yeah. She said, it's fine. I just needed approval because you've never had a bank account. And she just opened up the bank account. I gave her whatever, thousand dollars, five hundred bucks, opened up a bank account, walked out with some uh some temporary checks and a, a little deposit thing, and I have a bank account now. So when I refinanced that house and I got a check for whatever it was, sixty, seventy thousand, I went and I deposited a check and it went right in the bank account. Completely fake person. Um okay, so you know, what I did was I started making more and more of these guys. And these guys had everything. Like I had they would have a, uh, they had a job. I would go on SunBiz. I remember I'd go on SunBiz, which is the Secretary of State website in Florida. So if you have a register, if you have a, if you open a company, you're registered on SunBiz. So you can go there and you can just type in different names. And so I remember I started going with the name I was using was Express Tax Services because there was a bunch of Express Tax Services. Like if you put an Express Tax Services, there were several that had this very similar names. And I took one and I just used the tax ID number and it was in Miami. So I went and I registered a DBA for Express Tax Services because this was like Express Tax Services of South Florida or something. I, I went and I just registered a DBA as Express Tax Services. And, that, and then I registered the phone number. So if you went and looked for the phone number, it would give you a phone number that would dial a phone w- that would send you to a phone that I had that was sitting on my credenza in my office. I had a bank of multiple, probably half a dozen cell phones. So one of those was Express Tax Services. It would ring. I'd pick up the phone and I'd, Express Tax Services, how may I help you? Oh, you're looking for Joel Cologne? Oh, sure. Hold on one second. Or you know, put him on hold or say, I'm sorry, he's not in the office right now. I could have him call you right back. Regardless, I, I like had a whole system set up. And I was creating these fake borrowers and borrowing money. And that system was going pretty well. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. I don't know if I explained this or not. I would, I would, obviously, I was buy these houses for like $40,000 and I'm recording the value. I already went over that. But once these guys would get like a million dollars in mortgages in their names, you know, you get to that point where you just, there's just, they're overloaded with debt and their credit scores start going down. What I would do is I would, we'd stop paying. We'd stop paying on, on, you know, at some point you can't keep paying these mortgages. Once you've, if you borrow a million dollars and you've pulled out, let's say six or $700,000 and we've got six or 700,000, what we would do is you can't just keep using that money to make the payments. At some point I had to let these things go into foreclosure. So we just stopped paying. And when we'd stop paying, eventually the banks would start sending collection notices to all these guys' houses. And I would take the collection notices 
and I would write a letter from the borrower's phantom borrower's sister. And I would take, I would go into, let's say, the St. Petersburg Times or some newspaper article, and I would rewrite the article to include my borrower's name. So if someone, let's say there was a 12-car pileup on I-75 or I-4, and someone was life-flighted to Tampa Bay General Hospital, I would put my guy's name in for Tampa Bay for the person who was life flighted to the hospital. Then I would write a letter from his supposed sister saying that, listen, I know he hasn't been making the mortgage payment. I know you guys are about to foreclose. You might as well go ahead and foreclose because the doctors told us that he's, well, he's currently in a, in a coma, but the doctors told us even if he wakes up from the coma, he'll never work again. So he's not going to be able to make these payments. And I would send that letter along with a copy of the article with his name in it. So they would get the article and they'd look at it and they'd say, oh, wow, I see his name here. It's highlighted. And he was obviously in a car accident. Yeah, that's what happened. They would then foreclose on the property, put it on the market, and resell it. Now, they've obviously, they've lent, they think it's worth 200000 They lent 180000 They put it on the market. They might eventually, some, at some point, sell it for 90000 And they lost 90000 You know, they, maybe they sell it for 80000 And they lost $100,000. Now, since the value of the, pro- the area was going up, They would end up selling it for more than it was really worth, but not more than what they owed. And as a result of that, uh, they would stop looking like they wouldn't keep sending the letters. They would, they, they were given an explanation for why this person stopped making the mortgage payments. And that's all they cared about. Like they just need an explanation. And that made, made sense because those things happen. Well, I was doing this all the time. Like I was buying houses, buy four or five houses, six houses in one guy's name, pull out, you know, borrow a million, million and change in mortgages on the guy. And then I'd I'd get the money, deposit in the bank, pull the money out of the bank. It was, it was just going, it was just on and on and on. And, and we were taking that money. We were reinvesting the money. We were buying more and more real estate, like, and we're building new houses. I mean, I'd started a development company. I ended up. Gosh, I remember I bought at this point I was at this point I was divorced from my ex-wife. My current well, wife at the time, I guess no, she would be ex-wife then too. So, got a divorce. After we got divorced, I bought a house for like $80,000 and I renovated the house. Well, I got an apartment. I remember I got an apartment, and I started dating. I remember I dated this stripper that was living upstairs. She was insane. I mean, just crazy. Her name was Danielle. Most strippers are crazy. So what ended up happening was I I bought this one house and I was living in an apartment complex and I was renovating the house and, and, and I was renovating it. And I remember I needed to borrow more money on the house. Like I'm dumping a ton of money in this house. It had a, it was a four, had a four car garage. It had two apartments. It had... A one bedroom that was a one bedroom apartment that was twenty two hundred square feet. Like that's a huge, that's a huge one bedroom. Hardwood floors. I mean, I was just decking this thing out. And I, at one point, I needed it more money, and I had been. I started dating this other chick named uh, Connie Wick, and she was a manager of a lawyer's title on in Tampa. And I went to her and I was like, Connie, I have a question for you. And she was like, Yeah, what's up? Oh, I remember when I went on. I went on a date with her too, bro. I took her to see Les Misérables, which is a, a a musical. She loved it. I mean, listen, told like if you if you want to, you have a chick that you want to date, and you bring them to a musical, like it's over. I mean, you might as well just drive straight back to your fucking house. I mean, it's it's a panty dropper, like you can't believe. Because most guys won't do that. Like women want to go see like a musical. They want to do those things, but guys won't bring them. Like, that's like, you know, that's like for most guys, that's weird. That's gay. I don't want to be sitting through some bunch of people singing or whatever. But I'm telling you, if you go to see one, they're awesome. And if you're with a chick, it's over. Like, you just, you get to do whatever you want. So I brought her to uh, Les Mis, and then we went, I think we ate at like Ruth, Ruth Christ, went back to her place. I mean, just like pulled up to her place, and she goes, do you want to come in? I mean, she was just like, just come in. Like, you, you and I both know what this has been an amazing night just come in so go in there you know uh give her the best four minutes she's ever had in her life 
Um, and uh, we're laying in bed, and I was like, listen. I remember she told me we were laying in bed, and she she said, she started laughing, and I was like, what? Because she knew I'd been indicted, and I was already on federal probation. And she said, um, God, she remembered, she's like, I remember when we got subpoenas for your stuff before you got in trouble. Like, the FBI came in and subpoenaed your stuff. And, like, we were all like freaking out like oh my gosh and all the girls at her work started calling me Darth Vader and when they were she was like they were free they were like you're going out with Darth Vader tonight and, and she was like oh he's not that bad they were like I'm telling you he'll pull you over to the dark side like this guy's doing all kinds of fraud um, and we were laying in bed and she was laughing about it and I said you know it's funny that you say that I said I have a question for you and she goes what's that I said, I bought this piece of property for about 80 grand. I've dumped a hundred and something thousand in it. I need to borrow some more money on the property. How can I borrow more money on that property when I think it's only going to appraise for a couple hundred thousand? And she looked at me and she was like, well, I don't know. Um, What do you owe on it? I was like, well, you know, I, I owed a couple hundred thousand. I said, but I need to borrow more money. How can I, I said, how does the lender know that, there's a mortgage on the property. And she was like, well, I mean, they pull, they pull the title work. They have, she goes, they have us pull the title work. And when we go downtown, if the mortgage shows up, I go, yeah, but when the mortgage, how do I get rid of a mortgage? So they don't see it. And she went, well, I mean, when a mortgage is paid off, it's satisfied. And I went, well, how do they know it's satisfied? She goes, well, because the bank, when the bank gets paid, they send a, this one-page document that says it's a satisfaction of mortgage. Like it says that the mortgage that was taken out by this person on this date for this amount and, record, and recorded in the official record book on this page with this instrument number is hereby satisfied like the person paid us. She goes, and then it's notarized and the, the president of the bank or somebody signs it. And I go, what happens to that document? And she goes, well, it's typically mailed back to the um you know to the bank to show it was recorded and i'm like okay who how do they know where to mail it though and she goes well because they say in the upper left hand corner like hey it was prepared by bank of america and when it's after it's recorded mail it back to bank of america to this address and i goes, it one address and she goes well no there's bank of america's everywhere i mean who knows it could be any number of addresses and i went okay so let me get this straight you're telling me that I, if I fill out a one-page document with the correct information on it, I can get public records to record it in public records to show that, the, that a mortgage that's currently recorded in public records was satisfied. I can then have it mailed back to an address that isn't necessarily even the bank's address. And when you go to search it, you're going to see the original mortgage and a satisfaction, and you're going to list on the title you're going to list that there is no mortgage on the property. She goes, right, because I there's a satisfaction saying Bank of America paid it off. I go, even though they didn't. She goes, right. And I said, okay, so Bank of, she goes, as long as you keep making your mortgage payment, Bank of America doesn't realize that you that they no longer have a lien on the property. They think it's still there. They didn't get a, sat, a satisfaction. Of course, if they got the satisfaction, they'd realize right away, we didn't satisfy this. But that doesn't happen. So, okay. So I was like, okay, cool. And so I went downtown and I pulled, I pulled the mortgage on my property and I went down and I saw her and I gave it to her and I said, can you prepare a satisfaction of mortgage for this? And she was like, holy shit, you're seriously going to do this? I go, absolutely. And she said, I mean, I can show you, I can fill one out, but I'm not going to notarize it. And I went, that's fine. I said, I can, I can get a notary. I had already called like office depot, um, uh, uh, what was the other one? Staples. I'd already called several comp- several places and I'd ordered notary stamps in different names. And so I pay for the stamp. I go in. I, I didn't call. I went in. I, I filled out the paperwork. This is my, here's my name. Here's my notary number. Here's this. Here's that. Here's when it expires. And I said, I need a stamp. And then they would order it. And then I would just, they'd call you a couple days later or I'd just go in a couple days later and I'd say, hey, is my stamp here? And they'd go, sure. And they'd give it to me. They wouldn't ask for ID or anything. I had one place. I had like four or five places I ordered stamps from. One place asked me. The guy goes, do you have, a, you have your ID? And I was like, no, nah, bro. I mean, I came in here a couple days ago. He goes, yeah, well, I need your ID. I said, I don't know. have it on me. He goes, yeah, man. Uh, I said, well, I'll go get it and I'll come back. He goes, okay. So I left. I got his name. I left and I called down there and said, hey, when is this guy 
you know, is this guy there? And they said, uh, yeah, he's there. I called a little bit later and they said, oh no, he's off. He already left for the day. Okay, great. So then I went back in to the next person that was there and I said, hey, I need my notary stamp. And they didn't ask for an ID and they gave me the notary stamp. So I end up with multiple notary stamps and I, I just, once Connie filled out the, showed me how to do the satisfaction and she filled it out, I notarized it. I signed, signed it, went downtown and recorded it. I had it mailed to an abandoned house instead of mailed back to the, the, the mortgage company who had lent me the money. I just had it mailed to an abandoned house. So a couple days later I drive by there. Boom. I got the, I've got it. So now when I went to go borrow more money and the title company pulled the title on the house that I was using as collateral to borrow the money, there's no mortgage showing up. So I borrow another $175,000 or something like that on that house. It was worth maybe 200,000 at the time. I was still being renovated, but of course the appraiser that I was using didn't say it was being renovated. He said it was in perfect condition because we're ordering whatever. I mean, you know, this guy's doing how fuck, 10, 20 appraisals a month for the company that I used to own, but I'm still basically running in a, in a way. I mean, he's going to obviously he's going to do what we ask him to do or what I asked him to do, because otherwise I could yank 20. If you're being paid $400, three to four or $500 for an appraisal and you're getting 20 of them and you're, so you're making five to $10,000 a month off of this one lender or this one mortgage company, you're going to pretty much do what I ask you to do. So, and he was a cool guy. And so he said that the house wasn't being renovated, took a bunch of good pictures, said it was in perfect shape. And he said it was worth, I don't know what he said it was worth two, two fifty. So I borrowed another one seventy five. I then satisfied that loan and I borrowed two mortgages at the same time on the property. I borrowed a million dollars on this one piece of property and renovated that property. It was in great shape, built a concrete block wall around the whole thing, restuccoed the building new. It was, it was, it was a hard, put hardware floors, the whole thing, great kitchens, the four car garage. It was great. Great. Uh, Hey, sorry for interrupting the video, but want to let you guys know that if you join my Patreon at the top tier, every single month, you get a different painting and the contact information for my Patreon page is in the description. Back to the video. At that point, I really had that scam down and I really knew the paperwork. I, I remember by the second or third time I walked in to see Connie to ask her to fill out the paperwork. She was like, I'm not doing this. She's I'm not doing this again. I'm not filling this out. But by that point, I already understood public records fairly well. I'd been down there several times. She and I had had a bunch of conversations and I dated her on and off for a couple of months. And I was sorry. Then I stopped dating her. I started dating a chick named Jana. Jana was a, owned a, she owned a gym, like a little fitness gym in a strip mall. She was a nice little private gym and she was a, she was a personal trainer. She was an amazing shape, like blonde hair, blue eyes, a tiny little waist abs in um, like, I never should have been dating this chick. She was that good looking. She was that over the top good looking. And she had been dating a chick. When I say the chick she was dating was, she'd been dating some other chick. So she was a lesbian. She'd been with this other girl. They'd been dating for, I forget, like four or five years. They'd broken up. And my house, by the time, that's right, when I finished my house, so when my house got finished, there was something called a tour of homes. My house was, was um, one of, there was like six houses on the tour of homes. And what happens is, they sell tickets and people get to walk through your house. So they had all these nice houses in the Tampa Heights area, which was an area that I had moved into, which was booming. It was just, it was right next to Ybor city, which is where I was doing my scam. So it's convenient for me to be next to my scam area, the area I'm what they call farming. So I'm jacking up the prices of this area. I live right next to that area. I ended up buying my house and about four, three or four other houses that were on that street. Like on my one little block, there's maybe eight houses and I own five of them. Well, I ended up dating this chick, Jana, who had walked, she was walking through the tour of homes. She went on the tour of homes and as she was walking through my house, she, she actually stopped me and she's like, oh, you, you own, this is your house. You own this house. I was like, yeah, I remember I had painted a bunch of murals on the walls. She was asking about the murals and she said, I would love to buy a house in this area. Do you know who owns the house across the street? And I said, yeah, I actually own the house across the street. And it was being, we were in the middle of renovating it. 
and I wasn't using it like as a part of a scam or anything. I was just renovating the house. Like I was all, I'm always, I was always renovating something. I was always doing something. Like I'm always doing like five things, right? So, so at least something every, if you're doing five or six projects, at least every one month or so, something hits and you make a nice little chunk of change. And so I was renovating this property. And I said, yeah, I'm renovating it. She's, oh my gosh, I would love to talk to you about, about possibly buying it. And so we started talking and, uh, I got her phone number and I said, yeah, that's cool. I said, well, give me a call. And she got my phone number. I said, give me a call. We'll, we'll have to talk about it. Cause there was so many people, there were like a thousand people or so coming through the house. So I'm, I'm talking to other people and she leaves. She called me later and asked me if I wanted to have dinner. So I said, yeah, absolutely. And I was just thinking at first I thought she was interested in me. And then I, I talked to a buddy who told me she was a lesbian. And so we end up going to, uh, I think it's called Samurai Blue in Ybor City. But when we got there, I realized she was flirting with me, and I, I told her I could get her the house. That's probably why she dated me, just because I could get her the house. But it worked out for me because I started, you know, started hitting it, and it was amazing. Never should have been dating th- th- this chick. She was so smoking hot. And uh, you know the worst thing about her? She just had, like, no sense of humor. Like, I'm big on sense of humor. Like, a big part of my personality is that, you know, I'm funny. I'm entertaining and funny. She didn't find me entertaining entertaining at all she didn't find me funny at all not even remotely um uh, impressed by my by me at all but she did want to get in the house and what a great trade-off i mean it was a a good deal for me and we started dating so i obviously wasn't dating connie anymore i was dating gianna oh gosh 33 by this point by this point i'm on federal probation did I tell you that? Did I ever say I was on federal probation? Like I'd been arrested and everything. Yeah, I was on federal probation. And I was dating Jana. And then Jana and I broke up. I got her into three properties, by the way. She made money on every single property. One of those properties she bought, renovated, sold it, and made like $80,000 on the property. I mean, she's never seen that much money in her life. Oh, and all fraud, by the way. Every loan was fraud. I had to make fake, fake, um, fake ten forties. Everything. Her credit was crap. I mean, I had to do. I had to fix everything. I had to get her a new credit profile. I mean, it was just, it was just completely. I had to wipe her credit, get a new credit profile, get her secure. I basically had to create a synthetic identity that matched her identity to get her into these properties. But it worked. She made a bunch of money. You know, so. God, I was buy her, buying her stuff all the time. Yeah. You know, and I genuinely thought that, like, like at the time, I would have told you this chick really likes me. But really, I'm just paying for everything. So, uh, it was a trade-off. Anyway, then I started dating. And then I started dating. Uh, I started dating this chick, Allison. Listen, do you have any idea how many properties I owned at that point? I owned a fucking shitload. We owned a ton of properties. And you know what? It, when I say we, I mean me, Dave Walker, a guy named Jonathan Krieg, who was an investor, and a guy named Rudy. Rudy, I had met through an investor named Kelly. Kelly was in Tampa, was in Ybor City, and she and her husband, her name was Hal, were buying properties and renovating them. And I remember Kelly had come to me and she said, I'd already got her into a bunch of properties. And she was like, she's like, Matt, listen, she said, I need to buy that. I want to buy this, uh, this property. And all of our loans are fake or all fraud. So I was like, okay, well, what's, what's the problem? She goes, well, it's a five-unit building. And if you know anything about uh, real estate, if you've up, you can buy residential real estate. Or resi- you can get a residential loan from one to four units. But if you get five units, it becomes commercial. Well, that's a completely different animal altogether. I didn't do commercial loans. And she was never going to qualify for a commercial loan. And I didn't know enough about commercial loans. And, and basically, there was no comparable sales for the, for the property. So the property can't even qualify for a commercial loan. So she calls me and says, look, I want to buy this bar. I'm going to get this property, the problem. And I need to pull out money so I can do the renovations. I was like, how much do you need to pull out? And she was like 80000 to do the renovations or whatever it was. And I was like, man, but by this point, I'd recorded the value so many. I'd recorded the value of so many properties, like all the properties in the area were now starting to really record, like, like really come in high. So there, 
the whole area ballooned up. I mean, people are buying properties left and right, left and right. And, and guys are starting to pay ridiculous prices. Like I was started off on buying properties for $40,000 and got people, let's say there was some guy trying to sell a property for 50. I'd be, I would go to him and say, Hey, I'll buy it for 40. And they'd go 40. Oh, I want 50. And you'd go 50. You're crazy. Like I'm not paying you $50,000. I'm buying the same size properties for $40,000 and they're in better shape. I don't know. This actually happened. Well, all the properties, even the shithole started selling for higher and higher because we'd done, we'd recorded so many that the, the value in the area was shooting up. And I remember I went to this one old man and I asked him and he wanted 50 and I said, I'll give you 40. He said, no. So a couple, about four or five months later, I go back to him. I said, look, I'll give you, I'll give you the 50 grand you want because there was the, 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 the availability of properties were, were drying up. And so I said, I'll give you the 50 grand. He goes, now nah, I want 60 grand. I went 60, I'm not giving you 60 grand. Three months ago, you wanted, you know, three or four months ago, you wanted 50. Nah, nah. So I said, nah, man, forget that. Forget it. So I leave. A couple months later, I, there's so few properties. Like, we're now really starting to pay ridiculous prices for these for these just shitholes. And I go back to the old guy. I said, man, I'll give you 60 grand. He goes, man, I want 80. 80? How do you figure 80? Less than a year, you're telling me your property doubled? And he goes, he looked at me and said, have you seen what properties in this area are selling for? That house over there sold for $200,000. I'm like, no, it didn't. Like I bought that house for 50 and recorded it at 210 or 205 or 200, whatever it was. It was just like, you know, but what happened was I was, I was working against myself. I was creating these ridiculous comparables that now people that had houses that you couldn't even live in thought they were worth 90 or 80,000. So we're, we're still buying properties, pulling out properties. Uh, I had met Rudy because Rudy was the was the guy selling this piece of property that Kelly wanted to buy. So Kelly wants to buy this property. And I said, well, what's the problem, Kelly? Why can't you qualify for it? What, what's it? She goes, well, it's a five unit. So I said, okay. She said, um, you need to call the real estate agent. He was selling the property. I said, okay. So I said, I'll call him. And she goes, listen, he's a real jerk. And I went, I said, what's his name? He goes, Rudy. So... I call him up and I said, Hey, listen, I'm the, so Kelly says, look, can you call this guy and arrange it so that I can walk away with money? I mean, which by the way, it's just completely illegal. Like you're buying a piece of crap property that this guy was selling for like, like a hundred grand or something. And I'm getting, going to get it. I'm going to get the value recorded. I'm going to get it the sale. It's going to go through at like $240,000 so that she can one, bring a down payment, which she's going to get back and two, pull out like 80,000 so she can renovate the property. So I call the guy up. And I say, listen, I need you to do this and do this. I need you to get me a, uh, an appraisal for this. And the guy says, listen, man. He said, um, I've already had like three or four contracts in the last few months fall apart because you understand this thing is a commercial building, right? And I was like, yeah, I understand. I said, it's a, it's a five unit. And he goes, right, but it's, it's five units, so it's commercial. And, it's, it's, and I was like, okay, so it's, it's not, it wasn't zone commercial. But he said, it's a five unit, so you can't get a residential loan on it. I said, I understand that. And he said, well, how are you going to get this chick a loan? She said, you got her a bunch of them, but those are all houses or duplexes. I said, yeah, I'll be able to get her. I'm going to get her a loan on this. He goes, how? You have to get a commercial loan, and there's no other commercial properties in the area that you can compare it to. I said, because I'm going to get her a residential loan. And he goes, you can't get a residential loan on a five-unit building. It has to be four units or less. I said, right. I'm going to have the appraiser say that it's four units. And he goes, you have an appraisal that will do that? I said, I mean, I had two or three appraisals that would do that, appraisers that would do that. And he went, okay, are you, and you're sure about that? I said, absolutely. I said, so you need to write up. So I explained to him, write up the contract for $240,000. I needed him, then I had him go back on MLS and say, the pro, take it down, relist it at two hundred and like fifty thousand, and say that the property had recently been completely renovated and gone from a five unit to a four unit. I then met the appraiser out there and got him to say it was a four unit building and that the fifth unit, which was a little tiny efficiency, was actually um, a utility room where all of the electrical and junction boxes and everything were, and it was also storage. It was a storage unit where all the, they also had all the electrical. And there was a fifth, fifth uh, meter. And I had him say that that meter was the house meter, which ran the sprinkler system and all the lights. There was no sprinkler system. There was no exterior light system either, by the way. 
and the security cameras. Why not? So we, he does all of that. I get an appraisal for 250000 We have a sales price for two two forty. She gets a loan for like 80% or 80 or 90%. She gets the down, her down payment back plus the money back. She ends up walking away with like $80,000. She then renovates the property and actually renovates the property and, and does a decent job. It was such a shithole. Um, even when she was done, it was still pretty bad. So, but that's how I met Rudy. So I, I, so I, now I know Rudy, Rudy has an investor named Jonathan Creek who lends money to flip properties. We start having our not, or oh, I'm sorry, we start having this guy Creek lend money to our fake people to buy even more houses. So that's how it's like, it's, it just keeps ballooning up and ballooning up and ballooning up. And these houses are just going left and right, left and right. Um, they're, they're. We get some guy, he buys five houses, renovates it, gets a million dollars, pulls out six or $700,000, makes a few payments, lets them all go into foreclosure. So I'm going to wrap this up and I'm going to tell you about a time when I actually got caught. Actually, well, we got caught because Rudy screwed up and never mailed in the first payment. Oh, and that was Alan Duncan. That wasn't even one of the, the colored, uh, color-coded names. This was just Alan. The guy's name was Alan Duncan, one of my first uh, synthetic identities, but it was pre pretty good. So, so if you like the video, do me a favor, hit the like button, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you get notified so that when I put more videos like this out, uh, you'll be notified. Uh, leave a comment in the comment section and uh, share the video to any of your buddies. And uh, yeah, that's it. See ya.